Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 98, Linux wow. System D Explained. And Jay's going to do the explaining. I'm just a uh, audience member for this one. <laughs> he knows a lot about System D. This was a fun conversation <laughs> me and him uh, had because Jay's got a video he's working on because he learned that there's not as good a documentation as there could be. So Jay's going to fix that and solve the gap. He's going to fill it in, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it might be that there's so much documentation that nobody knows exactly what to hone in on. And then... Some of the features get buried, I think, is uh, the, what's going on. Yeah, there's a lot of cool features I didn't know you could do. Jay taught me some tricks last night when we were talking about this. So uh, we're excited to share this information with all of you. But before we do that, we do have to thank a sponsor, and that's going to be Akamai Cloud. They have been with us since they were Linode. <laughs> so I can say pretty much since the beginning, they did sponsor the show. It is a great place to run lots of the projects we talk about here. You can host it in our cloud. They have lots of cool pre-built essentially deployments that you can do to get a lot of different open source projects going. And uh, we just want to thank them for being a sponsor. They've been with us a long time and uh, we appreciate their support. And like yep. I said, we got an offer code down below to get you started with them. If you're looking for a place to host some of your projects that you may not want inside your lab, but somewhere in the cloud, throw it in the Akamai cloud. Yep, absolutely. Um, feedback. This was uh, a, a simple question. Well, there's two two questions. And I'll answer the first one they sent in first was, can I use one of those Zima boards? I think what, probably last episode we mentioned these, but Google Zima board, they're pretty neat. I have I have them on order. Uh, I don't know. Did you get one too, Jay? Or? Yeah, not yet. I, okay. uh, I probably should though. They were, uh, they were on sale, happened to be when we mentioned them last week. So I had, um, I had grabbed one. Uh, well, Are they still on one. sale or is that over? Uh, it was it was part of their May 4th sale, but nonetheless, it was like the May the 4th be with you type sale. Got so it. I heard Steve Gibson mention it and I was like, oh, cool. They're on sale. That's a good excuse to buy some of these. Uh, our friend Jeff from Craft Computing has reviewed them. They're pretty cool. Low powered boards. Great for home lab projects for sure. And because they have a PCIe slot on them. But the other question that someone had had was, could you use it as part of like the security onion network? And we have a episode where we do dove into security onion. And yes, this could be one of what they call like I believe it's a forwarding node. Basically security onion can be set up as your ingestion for all your security logs where you have a main security onion processing all the logs, but then you have forwarders, which are smaller ones that feed the larger. So I imagine it would work for that. And it might be a, a fun experiment. I have not gone that in depth on security and set up any nodes. I usually run it as one, one large node and force all the data into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question from the same person was about, do you start with containers or VMs when you're learning? And I want to say that VMs are probably easier to grasp because you're loading the whole operating system. It's just a virtual version of the instance, like, you know, whether you're loading Windows, loading Linux versus containers are going to be tied to the kernel. So there's a little bit of a different concept for how they work. It may or may not be more complicated. Um, that's always, you know, you, you'll find a tutorial that clicks with you, or maybe you'll watch 10 of them and one of them, you'll go, that's the one. But what you'll usually get, and as a lot of people do get hung up on containers, is the way the networking is in containers is a lot different. If you look at how you map ports mm -hmm. in Docker, for example, or even LXC or any of these, they're slightly different ways. So that may be a more challenging part. So uh, whichever one uh, is, it comes down to start with the project you want to accomplish. That usually drives you to where you want to be. If you start with, I want to build this type of project, then you'll start having to build all the things, all the knowledge you have to do to get to your end goal. Uh, that's usually a good way to get started with either one of those. Yeah, I would also say uh, part of the question also kind of depends on if it's starting out for getting a job or starting out for setting up a home lab. Not everyone that has a home lab uh, works in IT, obviously, because, you know, for some people, that's their, that's their hobby and that's sacred. They don't want to, um, you know, put a put a, a paycheck on that, that they want that separation. For other people, it's all about learning things for their IT career. So that kind of does differentiate the answer. If it's your home lab, then, yeah, you know, like you said, just find a project, something you want to run and learn everything around that. If it's for a job, I always tell people, look at job ads. Um, if you're currently employed, don't do that at your work, um, on your work <laughs> network. But um, even if you're not looking for a job, you could, you, I mean, the job boards are a great way to know what people are looking for. And you could just keep looking at them to know what skills are, you know, more, in more demand. But when it comes to VMs or containers and, you know, in your career, there's no or. And I think that's the first thing to learn about IT. Um, you know, you'll usually get somebody that 
learn something for the first time. It's like you learn how to use a hammer and everything becomes a nail. That doesn't yeah. mean it's the best tool for the job. Um, so there's no or, learn both. But you can't learn both at the same time. So I do agree, you know, VMs before containers. But I would say, uh, depending on how entry level you are, networking 101 should be first. You have to know how traffic gets from point A to point B. You don't have to be Cisco level. That's not the point. The point is just to know the basics. And once you have the basics of networking 101, learn Linux 101, just just uh, the very you know entry level things there. There's plenty of videos on my channel for that. And then learn you know the basics basics of VMs. Start with VirtualBox, maybe uh, you know graduate to Proxmox later, and then run some containers on your machine. And then just keep rotating through those same things. So after you get the basics of all of those, rotate back to networking, level that up a level, and then go back to Linux, level that up again, and then just keep rotating through those things as your foundation. And then you'll your skills will just keep going. It's interesting the person says, you know, to get out of the weeds the fastest. Um, the other thing to learn about IT is that there's always weeds and they're never ending. And you're always going to, um, I mean, I've been in this for, you know, well over two decades. I lost count at this point. And just this week, I'm contacting you about my network. I'm like, I've never seen anything like this. What the heck is going on? <laughs> that never stops. Like some people might think, um, you know, when I get to Jay and Tom's level, I'm just going to know everything there is to know. Um, believe me, we have conversations all the time about why doesn't this work? And it happens to everyone. It never stops happening. So the first, you know, one of the first things to understand is that there is no point at which you are knowing everything there is to know. You will be stumped from the beginning of your career all the way to the end. You just have to like the puzzle. You just find uh, joy in solving the puzzle and that'll carry you through all of it. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I helped Jay with the networking thing and then he taught me last night something I didn't even know System D could do, how you edit units and things like that. I'm like, this is, how does this work? This is magic. Right. This is so right. cool. And, you know, I've been using Linux. I joke I've been using Linux since floppy, but uh, Jay's courses, by the way, are definitely worth going through because I'm occasionally using commands wrong and I've learned from watching Jay's videos which commands I'm using wrong. So if you're getting started, his the fact that Jay has really good incremental series on that Dude, it's really helpful. Go go click on those series, watch them in progression. It's uh, solid content and it definitely can get you leveled up on there. I Even myself as a veteran, by rewatching some of it, Jay has some better insights into the proper ways of doing it. Um, we won't even talk about him watching me use find. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but at yeah, least it made him laugh. Too, yeah. and, and I would say watch the Linux Crash Course series on the channel. It's a, it's a well, at least right now, it's a never-ending series. You can watch it, the videos in any order. It's not... There are a few where I might say, you know, you should watch this other video first, but each video is standalone. So you could just piecemeal yeah. the ones you want. You could blow through them all if you want or just watch one or two. It's up to you. And I thought I'm up to, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm up to 60 episodes and counting at this point. And um, they range from like, you know, seven minutes up to like 45, depending on the topic. And I just keep going and I have like 10 more planned. It doesn't seem like this series is going to end anytime soon if it ever does. So much fun. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, in something I have in my notes here, updates to software, it turns out, excuse me, there's a security flaw announced just before this. I was mentioning about the new Unify uh, updates. Well, they went from, you should probably load them if you want the new features to, you should load them if you don't want to have this security problem. Uh, basically, as long as you're off of and into the three series on your unified dream machines uh 3.0 on up i believe in whatever the latest is of course as a recording um is going to have that fixed so just a little heads up there was a flaw someone found um i don't know all the details of it but i knew i, I happen to follow one of the people who works for ubiquity uh on twitter and they tweeted it right away it's it's public in uh knowledge in their forum so there's an update so um make sure you stay patched especially anything that faces the internet like your routers um mm -hmm. one thing good about ubiquity i i may dog on them about some of the routers and things like that but one they will auto update um uh, if you unless you've told them not to the default i know on new models is to auto update and two they're really on top of problems if bugs are reported to them uh they do i've never dogged on them about security they've actually been very on top of that as an aspect of if there's a flaw found they have a bug bounty program. They have a good code review. Um, when they find flaws, they fix them. So uh, good shout out to them for being on top of it. And, uh, you know, we I hate when companies, because it was exploited in the wild and because they were finally outed by bleeping computer, they decided to release a patch. <laughs> That's I, I hate the reactive companies like that. That's always much more aggravating. I think those same companies, like, 
they put val or they rate the value of a product if it ever had a CVE, not understanding that everything has a CVE eventually. If mm. and if it doesn't, it's just because no one's found it yet. But some some companies, I I just uh, have to face palm their way of thinking about technology. But I haven't had any problems like that with Unify either. I I remember uh, for me, auto update was not enabled that because that was before the newer models. But I turned it on. And it's, I think it's checking at some point in the early morning. And I, I'm just never behind. I check it every now and then just to make sure. And I've never had to go back in and say, hey, why didn't you update it? It just takes care of everything. And I also, um, another news, have this uh, wireless scan. I forgot what it's called. That happens every night just to make sure everything's on it, uh, the proper channel. Uh, so even that adjusts itself. I think it's a pretty good platform. And yeah, um, yeah I've, I've never had any issues with security either as of yet. Yeah, they, they're good about the updates for that. Um, yep. On kind of a, a final note before we jump into our topic today, I did do finally the new Graylog video, and that's all published on my channel. So if you want to get started with Graylog, we've done a, a episode about it. But one thing that came out of this is people's confusion of how observing and logging versus so essentially systems that are observability and monitoring, such as Zabbix or Prometheus that you can do this with versus logging, mm -hmm. which is what Graylog does. Um, if uh, you want to send us some feedback or at least some comments, if that's a good topic uh, to cover and kind of the differences between them and where you use each one. I also, and Jay doesn't know this, I was on the phone with Phil for our friend who worked for the Linux foundation and uh, he's, he wants to, uh, I don't know if he's going to do it on here or just do it on my channel, but he wants to come on and talk about observing things at scale and um, a lot about certificate transparency. Uh, he has a lot to say about that because of uh, what, what he does for a living. So um, those are a couple yeah. other topics that definitely send some feedback on what you want to know about that. But I, I think it, clarifying the difference between observability um, and logging and what that means, what you monitor. And even though both of these systems can alert, they alert differently based on what's happening. And I think maybe an explain, explainer for that might be a fun episode just to break it down to why you use Zabbix, when you would use, you know, Graylog um, and why I don't use Loki. Unless someone can, can correct me on this, I looked into Loki because someone says, well, can you compare other open source logging servers? And since Elastic changed their license, um, that kind of rules them out because they have Logstash, but the license is a little confusing to me. Um, so I, after they forked it, that's why I mentioned open search. But Loki is what people kind of went to, at least in the comments. But I think the reason they're asking for a video is because I went through a little bit of the documentation and correct me if I'm wrong. Loki is easy to deploy with Docker, but really hard to configure and is not near as flexible as Graylog. If someone if someone can point me on a good um, like tutorial on it, I, I don't mind looking at it. But when I what I looked at was it's a neat project that's very targeted to the DevOps community. As long as you're configuring it all in a series of config files from the command line, that's great for DevOps people. But I don't know that's always as flexible as you might get with a, in a nice web UI you get with Graylog. But hey. Head us up at feedback at the home lab show, uh, feedback at the home lab dot show. So we can, you know, hear from you and you make sure we're guiding you along the way in the content so we can provide you the best. So, yep, that's what we do. That's what we do. That's how, you know, this is actually how Jay came up with system D. I think you weren't you at a talk and someone was yeah. talking about it. Jay's like, I have to cover this. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this happens a lot. So I, I have this uh, list, I call it my backlog of ideas. And there's usually about 50 to 60 ideas or something like that at any one time. And then, you know, every month I pick some from that pool. I think I, I wanted to do a system D video for a while. And yeah, I was at a conference and I, I just walked in and then um, some people started talking about system D and it wasn't like a negative conversation. This wasn't like a, you know, a rant or a debate or anything. It was just somebody saying, you know, did you know about this? Which, which I did. I actually coincidentally discovered it two weeks earlier, uh, the system CTL edit command, um, which nobody in the room knew that existed. And, and, and there was something like I mentioned system D timers and then um, everyone's like, what there's timers. And it became very obvious to me that um, the way people think of system D is I could use start, stop, restart, and reload to manage services. And that's basically all anyone does. And to nobody's offense, it's just, you know, the main purpose of it. But there's other things and other tools. And, you know, some people are hand editing, um, you know, the unit files. And which is nothing wrong with that if you know how to do it, but there's tools that are available and, and a lot of people just don't know they exist. So the conversation kind of happened and I wasn't even really part of it much. I was just kind of listening. I'm like, 
Yeah, I think that went up a, a big uh, priority level here because there's clearly some confusion here. And I think I just need to put out a video, which may end up being more than one at this point, um, about this topic to just give people something that they could use as reference. And it's not but that the documentation doesn't exist. It's just that everything I've read about System D, it, it explains it in way, way too many paragraphs. Like, you don't need that many to explain one command. It just goes on and on. And um, who would know where those, you know, hidden features are if they're trying to find them in a wall of text? I feel like there comes a point when there's too much documentation, you have to condense it and make sure it's effective. Um, but then again, maybe some people like that uh, big wall of text, so I, I shouldn't judge. But then again, people also don't know about these features. So here we are. It, and I overlooked when we were talking about how to edit a unit file. <laughs> I overlooked the feature right away. Jay, Jay called me out on it um, of yep. how you think you edit it and how you actually <laughs> edit it are two different ways. <laughs> it goes against the norm. Um, so basically the video has been filmed and I wanted to cover a, a, you know everything in one video. I have to see how long it is. I might need to do it in a follow-up. So one thing that's not in that, in that video is system D timers, which may be a separate video or I might edit it into the current one. I haven't decided yet, but it might be a couple of weeks until this comes out it the majority of the video is already filmed and if i decide to do two parts then all of the video has been filmed so what what the video does when it comes out is going to start you at the very basic level like the things that most people know if they've been using linux for a couple of months the you know the start stop restart and all that and then from there it goes into you know the directories unit files are stored in and why there's a, a few of the that you should pay attention to um, looking through a unit file what's the difference between a you know a, what's a unit file and a service file i cover those things so um pretty much everything i'm going to say today is is a preview of what's going to be in that video uh, there's there's it, it's just pretty much all of it so um let's starting back at the beginning um, and this is, you know, territory where more people than others will know this already, but system D is an init system. That's its core function. It's PID one. If you look at, you know, if you open up HTOP, you'll see PID one is system D if you're using a distribution that does use system D. And there are distributions out there that do not use system D if that's not your flavor. So, you know, some people, and I'll get this out of the way, are saying, well, system D is going to be in every distribution and I don't like it. And then I'm thinking, well, it's okay. You don't have to like it. But anyone who knows Linux knows that there's never, I repeat, never a situation where all distros are all in. There's always going to be some that are not. There's always going to be some that go a different direction. So um, to, to think that every distribution is going to use it and there's going to be no distro that doesn't, that's just not the way it works. Um, Linux is, I mean, there's a lot of opposition in the Linux community. I mean, you could have something that's super amazing and there's going to be someone that doesn't like it, but that's, that's why we have distributions and things like that because people are allowed to take it in different directions and fork it. But System D is in the pri primary distros, you know, like Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, um, Arch. Arch was one of the first. Um, CentOS, all the Red Hat distributions. It's in quite a few. So if you learn it, then you're learning the init system for, you know, all the big players. So your skills do go very far by learning this. And it's something that I do recommend people learn at least a little bit beyond the, the core start, stop, restart, and, and things like that when it comes to services. What's the most popular replacement for system D? What's well, you know, I, I don't have numbers, but I know like there's OpenRC, there's some distributions that still use Sys5 in it. Um, there's, you know, Launch D and a number of others, but I don't really know which ones are, um, you know, the most common because I haven't looked at the numbers. But system D far, obviously system is number D is one. the most but... common by far. That's, right. that's what I'm most familiar with. It's like, what's number two? I'm, I'm not really sure off the top of my head, but it's probably one of those. Uh, but that's an interesting question. Now I'm going to have to look that up after we're done. So yeah, that'll be another thing to look into, which I love that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So basically, as you know, I go through, uh, you know, a number of years using system D, just like everyone else, I'm just using start, stop, restart status, you know, when it comes to the system CTL command. So, you know, and I'm going to try to keep the commands light here because this is a podcast. I don't want anyone to just scramble to go find a pen or something. Everything I'm going over in this episode will be in the video. So you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything like that. Um, if anything else, you could listen to this podcast and then the video will reinforce it. So um, that being said, 
system CTL is the command that you'll use primarily with system D and you'll, you'll use it like, uh, you know, system CTL status, for example, and then the name of a unit. And then you could do restart and status. Well, I just mentioned status, but then there's stop and sometimes reload. But you have those controls in place to, you know, do, you know, one of those things to the process. So you could have Apache running. I mean, you could restart it. You could stop it. You could check the status of it. Um, there's enable, which means it starts up when you boot the system. Disable is the opposite. It's not going to start up automatically. And in my opinion, I feel like that's, Basically, basically where everyone stops, including myself for a long time. I never went any further than that because I was okay with that. Later on, I started creating my own um, you know, unit files. But even then, I, I haven't done that as often as I would like to. So I never did a deep dive. But as soon as I started um, you know, looking into some of the features that Systemd has that most people don't know about, then, you know, I went deeper and deeper and deeper and I started learning some things myself and then fast forward to today and the video has been recorded and is going to be released on the channel, hopefully soon. Um, sometimes it could be as long as a month before I have something edited. Uh, other times I could be obsessed over it and get it done the same day. So it's kind of a big variance there, but I guarantee you it will show up on the channel um, sometime um, early summer, late spring, um, maybe even next week. You never know, but it's coming. So that's a good thing. So soon. Yeah, soon. And so I'll get into some of the features that I didn't know about when I, you know, have been using systemd for the longest time. But be actually, before I get into that, there's one thing that I want to make sure everybody understands, because sometimes the terminology can be confusing, and I think it confused me as well. Um, so I'll ask you this, Tom, do you know the difference between a uh, unit file and a service file? Oh, I thought they were the same until you asked the question. <laughs> Well, you're not you're technically not wrong. Um, a service file is a type of unit file. Everything okay. that systemd manages is a unit file. So if you have a mount file, that's a unit file. If you have a timer, that's a unit file. A service is a unit file. So um, I I fixate on services because you know service files because this is going to be the thing that most people will manage with systemd. You, you're not going to have nearly as many mounts or timers as you are services running on your system. So when you do you know start stop or whatever against a service or a, a unit in particular, but um, a service is going to be a process running in the background. So your Apache, Nginx, whatever it is, SSH, those are going to be uh, service files, but service files are a type of unit file. So that kind of gets that out of the way. So if anyone's kind of confused about that, um, hopefully now they're not. So the first thing that I didn't know that I learned uh, just by, I don't even know how I found this out. I think I was just messing around with Ansible and somebody mentioned it in the comments. Um, and I'm kind of curious, you know, in the chat room, if anyone has already heard of system CTL edit and then the name of a unit, just say, just raise your hand or just, you know, give, give yes us some no. kind of inclination in the chat room. There is a bit of a delay. My theory is that there's going to be probably a few people that have heard of it, but I think the majority probably haven't because even for me, I think it was like two weeks before that panel, I found out about that myself. So even I was late learning this. So when you have a service file and you want to edit it, what most people do, and there's nothing technically wrong with this, they'll grab a service file, maybe they'll download it from you know the developer of the application or what have you, create one themselves if they want to, and they'll drop it in the Etsy systemd system folder. And that's not there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, that, that's fine. That that's where it's supposed to go. And um, you know, systemd is able to handle that. So there's nothing wrong with that workflow, but what people may not know is that um System CTL edit is a command that lets you edit a service file similar to how you have uh, Visudo for editing the sudoers file. They recommend you not edit it directly. They have a command. And when you use that, it opens up a temp file. And you, if there's a syntax error, it warns you before it saves it. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure if there's, it's going to, you know, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a syntax checker, but I'm not going to um, swear it doesn't because if it doesn't, it probably will. But what happens when you use system CTL edit and then the name of a service file, and you don't even have to have a path. It could be httpd.service or apache2.service if it's Apache is one or the other. And what that'll do is open up your de you know default text editor in your terminal, and it'll have the unit file or the service file in this case on the screen all commented out. 
So this is where we get into the territory where, um, you know, I was like, I was messing with this. I'm like, why won't it save my changes? Like every time I do this and then I save the file, it says there's nothing in the file, but there is. I, I saw like a bunch of lines of text. I uncommented uh, what I wanted to change and nothing worked. But what I realized is the answer is right there in front of me. It's just maybe my ADD caused me not to look at it. it, it there's a comment that says, Anything below this line is going to be, you know, yes. basically skipped. And it tells you between these two lines, put your changes. So what you look, what you do with this is you look at the commented out unit file as just, you know, an example of what's there now for reference. That's all it's for. You type in between the two lines, the uh, heading, for example, unit in brackets, and then the option you want to change. And you don't have to like put the entire service file, just what you want to change. And when you save it, it creates an override file. So the original systemd unit stays where it is. So if apt or DNF updates that package, that's no problem. It can do that all day long because your override file will take priority and any options that you have in that file of that name, the same name, are going to override any similar options in the original file. So that allows you to kind of just, you know, override that. And the other thing you can do is that same command, but you add dash dash full, F-U-L-L, -L, and instead of the commented out reference style, it's going to bring up the entire service file right there in your text editor. And when you save it, it creates a unit file, the same name in a directory with a higher priority that will override the distributions version. And this is something that I, um, I really didn't know it could do. I thought, you know, you just edit service files or unit files in general manually, put them in the right folder and call it a day. But I you know, I learned that this command exists and it makes the process a lot easier. And, you know, that's the first thing that I didn't know about systemd when I started looking into it. Yeah, it was really interesting. And the answer is right there because um, it's the third line down. You put, it just doesn't seem obvious because of all the extras down at the bottom <clears throat> of it when you run right. this. Um, so when you're doing and editing these, these unit files, you just put it in there and then you save it and it goes where it's supposed to go. <laughs> yep. And there's going to be a systemd system folder there's multiple folders where these units can be found, but there's three that you should pay the most attention to. Slash lib slash systemd slash system slash run slash systemd slash system and slash etsy slash systemd slash system. And they have a different priority each and a different purpose each. And this is one of the things that some people may not know. So the, the first folder is, is what's different. The other two direct subdirectories are the same, systemd, system. So you have one in live, etsy, and user. Okay. User, you know, we're not going to really get into because that's runtime stuff. But the slash live slash systemd slash system, if you install a package, let's say Apache, Nginx, whatever it is, that's where the service file goes from the distribution. It goes in slash live slash systemd slash system. And this directory has the lowest priority. So any of the other directories, if you have a colliding config option or a colliding file with the same name, then anything in a directory of a higher priority is going to you know, take precedence. So slash live slash systemd slash system is a directory again where distributions put the service files that are part of the distro and it has the lowest priority. So that way it's the easiest to override if you don't want to go along with the distributions version of that unit slash run slash system d slash system that one has a higher priority than that folder but we're not going to really talk about that folder much but the ultimate priority the biggest priority is slash etsy slash system d slash system if, if uh, system d sees something in that folder man it's, it's just like that is the one for me i'm going to go for that one no matter what's in any other folder that's what i want that's why when you run the commands i just gave you the override files are saved in that directory. That's also where you put service files if you create one manually in that directory, because that way um, that directory won't be managed by apt or DNF or anything. So it's not gonna like, you know, an update isn't gonna blow away anything, but it does have a higher priority, like I mentioned. So that's why all the tutorials out there pretty much tell you to put the service file in that directory. So if you didn't know why you should put it there, well, now you do, highest, highest priority and doesn't collide with your package manager. So there you go. Yes, I've seen someone mention, um, I imagine this is the same for Arch, but I, the way they had done it had, when Arch updated, it had broke some of them. So this is to avoid any of the breakage when you do the updates. Yeah, yep. Um, another thing with Arch is system, or not, I'm saying system B, um, LVM snapshots. 
uh, just play with that in a VM with with an Arch installation, you know, not your production machine. But I always love having a um, LVM snapshot before I run a update, a full upgrade in in Arch because, you know, if I, if it breaks something, I could just roll back the snapshot and it's like nothing ever happened. But anyway, that's another story for another yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another one that I like is um, blaming System D. You know, I, I just like to blame it. Actually, no, I'm just being silly. Um, but it, there is a systemd blame command. It's systemd hyphen analyze together. So systemd hyphen analyze and then blame. When you run that command, and this is really cool, it's going to list all of the service files, specifically service files, so none of the other type of units. And what it's going to do is order them from the the lowest amount of time it took for that service to start up to the mo the most time a service took to start up. So if your system is taking a long time to boot, then you can look at this to find out what service in particular was the one that caused the boot process to take so long. And sometimes there could be more than one. So you might have some that take, you know, like a second, no big deal. But if you have one that's taking like 30, 45 seconds to start up, then uh, that's a problem. You might want to take a look at that. So when you run that command, since it's ordered the way it is, the first thing you'll see is the highest amount of seconds services took to boot. So from lowest to highest with highest at the top. So that way you can know immediately, okay, there's something going on with this service right here because it's taking like a long time to start up. And if you're having trouble with your boot process and it's taking a long time, well, now you can know exactly what it is that is causing that to, to be the case. So there's another nugget of information that'll be useful. I just ran out of mine and it turns out snap. That's the that's the slowest service. How I am I start. not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> how many? I mean, how many other people are going to find the same thing is the case that they're running on Ubuntu? Because um, I, I'm at the point now. It's just like e even though you know I wrote the book on Ubuntu, but man, if I hear Snap one more time, uh, it's just You're one of those snap? things that I'm going to snap. It's just one of those <laughs> things that's just like. Um, it's the joke that keeps on giving by a comedian that's not really all that funny. You know, just, yeah. just I'm going to tell the joke over and over again and, and somebody will laugh eventually. No, it's not happening. Stop. That's another tangent altogether. Yeah, we, I, I'm not I, could go I didn't have an opinion on Snap until I did the Greylog video. So, yes, I have an opinion on it and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't. Um, as another side story, I love universal apps. I think there's a great purpose for those. But I, I yeah, there's some issues with Snap with uh, Snap packages and that's just uh, not cool. So i um, not surprised to see that that's the case at all. Um, system D timers, on the other hand, uh, is new, and this isn't in the video right now. So I might do this as part of like another one, or like I said, I might edit it into this one if it ends up not being too long after I cut it down. But system D timers essentially let you do what cron does, but with more options. For example, if you have a job that you want to run, I don't know, at 9 PM and for whatever reason had a power outage, you know, server's not on at 9 PM. So it wasn't able to run when you started up the next time. Then with a system D timer, if you configure it the right way, what'll happen is say, hey, I was supposed to run yesterday at 9 p.m., but I didn't get a chance. The server's off. I'm going to run right now. And it'll just make sure that the job still runs when it has the next available opportunity. And there's other things in, in timers as well that you could do that are uh, pretty cool. I actually switched all of my cron jobs to system D timers at this point. Um, it's not going to be something that's going to make anybody... You know, jump for joy. But I think if you see all the additional things that system D timers can allow you to do, then you might have a have an argument to potentially just drop a crown job and and you know make it a system D timer instead. And that that's a little confusing to set up, honestly, um, which is why it needs a video because you still need a, a service file with a timer. You need two. The timer is when is what tells the service file to run so you still need a service file because what else is the timer going to tell to run the timer and the service file will have the same name so you have service name dot service and then service name dot timer for example and then the question is well do you start it do you enable it yes the answer is yes and and another question might be well if i'm starting the timer do i need to or i'm enabling the timer do i need to enable the service no but there's a reason why you might so if you have a service enabled, it starts at boot. That happens regardless of if you have a system D timer or not. If you have no timer, it's going to start at boot. If you have a timer, it's still going to start at boot because you told the service to start at boot. The timer also needs to be enabled. Otherwise, it's not even going to run because it has to be enabled. It also has to start up. It has to be started and enabled as well. So um, you can decide to not enable the service 
because the logic is the timer is just going to run the service whether it's enabled or not. But you still might want that service to run at boot. If it's a job, for example, a reporting job, you might want it to run at boot time. And then also when the timer um, goes off and decides to run it again, or you might be satisfied with the timer running it when it's time and, and not having that enabled, and that's okay, that's up to you. So at first I thought it was confusing. You had two uh, unit files, a timer and a service. But when I saw the functionality having them split gives you, then I was okay with it at that point. But it took a little bit of um, you know researching because there wasn't a lot of information about this, but um, there will be when I do the video on that part. And something I realized kind of going back to the uh, blame part, you mm -hmm. can actually say system analyze and plot. It'll create an SVG output to plot out all the timings of all the service startings. I thought that was kind of neat. There was a lot of commands in the system D analyze or subcommands that I, I've only looked at that one. That, that just gives you an idea that there's probably going to be at least one more video <laughs> about this and, per, and maybe even two more, but I don't think it'll take any more than that. And then people can watch those videos and know, you know everything they need to know. But I think the majority of that you'll learn in the, in the video I already did. Another thing it doesn't go over is system D mounts, which will probably be another video. So. You can have you know, the SEFS tab handle mounts for you, but you can also create a mount file with systemd, and when you start it, it mounts the, fo the folder. You can make sure it's always mounted, for example. If that's something that you know, cannot be you know, unmounted, it, it's required, there's something important there. It has to be there on the file system. You can make uh, systemd keep an eye on that. You could also add a keyword. I forgot what it is. I think it's like x systemd mount. You could put in SEFS tab that Tell, that makes FS tab tell systemd, hey, uh, you should pay attention to this as well. Um, so that way you could you could have one or both, but you you could omit the FS tab completely and just create a systemd unit to, uh, you know, mount a remote file system, which is pretty cool because that that's just that just gives you some functionality and you could decide not to have it enabled. Maybe there's a non-demand file system used once in a while, so you can just do systemctl start and then the name of the mount service or mount unit and it'll then mount it when you want it to be mounted or it could be mounted all the time. But you also have a unit type of auto mount. Auto mount gives you the same capability as auto FS on demand. Okay, you want this to be mounted when it's used, unmounted after it times out. Same thing as auto FS, but it's within systemd, it has that built in. In that case, you'll have a mount unit and an auto mount unit, both. The mount unit will mount the file system, the auto mount unit will handle the dynamic nature of it. So those two things together will give you the auto FS equivalent built right into system D so you can manage your file systems with it, which I thought was pretty cool. I think that was the first thing I've ever learned about system D outside of uh, process management that um, when it comes to extra features. So I've, I've known about that one for a while, but I think of the, of the things I mentioned, that's probably the most likely that people will know exists, but I'm, I'm sure there's still a few that aren't aware of that. It's really interesting. Uh, someone said there's an example of FS uh, trim dot timer to start something when you only want to enable the timer, but for some reason you want to run it right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Just star the service file and you don't need to wait for the timer. Yep. And that's okay. another example of another unit file. There, There's a bunch of these. Like I mentioned earlier, a service is a type of unit file, but it's not the only type. You know, we met, we went through timers and I gave you some information on, on mounts and auto mounts. There's a number of these. There's sockets, for example. There's just a number of these different kind of unit files. So the file extension gives everything away. That tells you the type of unit that it is. So a service file is going to have dot .service, a mount is going to have dot .mount, an auto mount unit will have dot .auto mount, and so on. So that helps you understand what kind of a unit file that happens to be if you were going through the directories that I mentioned. And again, I'll have all those directories in the video. So don't worry about writing it down. It's fine. Uh, the video will come out and uh, you could you could uh, refresh yourself with it when it comes out and you'll get uh, the screen recording and all that showing everything I'm talking about, which uh, for a lot of people, that's kind of needed to uh, make that stick. It's kind of neat because I'm looking myself through the commands kind of as we go here, but this is like sudo systemd dash mount so you can mount things with systemd mm -hmm. um and then unmount it's kind of interesting there's a lot i never really dug deep into that i usually just enable disable a service you know the usual tasks that i need to do to set a service up or get something going on a linux server for one of my builds but there's a definitely you tab a couple times with autocomplete and you're like there's a lot of things i can touch here <laughs> well in some cases though 
It might be required, believe it or not, because I found out the hard way. Um, if you if you mount NFS four in the Etsy FS top, excuse me, Etsy FS tab file, that's fine. I mean, everyone does that, and the NFS version four is obviously supported. It's a native thing. But um, what I found out the hard way is that Nautilus in GNOME does not support NFS four. Believe it oh. or not, it just doesn't. So you can't use it there, but you can use it with FS tab. You could use it with system D. If you mount it with either of those solutions, then it's just a file system. Gnome sees that it's there. There's a bug report already about this. And um, I think I've seen comments going back years up until now. And there's some difficulty, which doesn't make sense to me because, you know, everywhere else on, you know, Linux distributions, they all support NFS4, but Gnome doesn't. And I don't know why. So I spent hmm. some time the other day um, just grumbling. I'm like, why can't I access this path? I'm typing it perfectly in the um, in, in Nautilus where you go to other locations and it still doesn't work. And I, I checked the mount. The path is fine. Find out you can't mount it. So in that case, I, I have to use systemd or fstab to mount that file system. Normally in GNOME, you could just bookmark a network share. You don't even have to add it anywhere. You could just have it in the left side and GNOME will figure, that, figure out the rest. But um, if anyone is a you know, a master of NFS4, then you might want to contact GNOME developers and see if you could fix that bug because it's just, it's, it's one of those things that I was surprised that GNOME isn't able to do through Nautilus. That, that was shocking to me, actually. Because it's able to support SMB perfectly fine and it'll mount um, SSH file systems perfectly yep. fine too. I, I It's always been really convenient to be able to, you know, open up the UI and be able to manipulate, manipulate files that way. So yep. I, I did not know it didn't support NFS. Um, but NFS I don't know. Or... But NFS it does four. support NFS three, so I just want to make sure that's what's understood here, because um, apparently my NFS shares on TrueNAS are NFS four, so that there you go, and that was, um, you know, that was and it was interesting to find out for sure. So, um, you know, that's a, a tidbit for anyone out there that might be fighting with this. Why won't you mount? Well, that's why it, it just won't until the bug is fixed. So, interesting. Yep. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that was a lot of information. I don't want to overload anybody because at some point um, it becomes a uh, tutorial without a screen recording, you know, and that's- Yeah, yeah, so we offer. definitely need to so, do yeah. that. Um, and one last command I'll throw out there because I just typed it and it looks cool. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a top command essentially. So it's um, systemd-cg top to show the uh, unit files running and what they're doing. You know, that's interesting. Now, speaking of that, that reminded me of something not related, but it still reminded me of this all the same. I um, just randomly opened up HTOP on the new Fedora. They just came out. And, you know, all my systems, I use HTOP all day long. So I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, why does this look weird? There's something weird about um, Fedora's HTOP and I can't put my finger on it. But then it dawned on me, there's an IO tab now that shows you all the IO on its own tab in HTOP. So... Uh, I haven't looked into this yet, but it, it might just be a new uh, default feature for HTOP, possibly oh. for newer versions. But I only noticed that in Fedora uh, 38. I didn't see that in, you know, I'm using Pop! OS on my desktop and it's the same as it's always been. But if anyone has, um, you know, Fedora 38 or a newer distro, try HTOP. See if you have the IO tab. I thought it was pretty cool because um, IO is very often the killer of performance yes it's it's a in i there's actually another uh tool you can lose called io top where you can start looking at what processes and uh what what disk writes they're doing so you can kind of figure that out as a problem because sometimes you'll have a system with a high service load but you won't see many things running and it may not have a high cpu load but that load is actually coming from the io being too intense a database writing somewhere that it doesn't have quite the bandwidth it should have so it can really slow down your system troubleshooting all those things is always uh lots of fun yeah uh someone's asking in the chat room about system d home d and no i haven't looked into that yet uh, i haven't used a distribution that, that has that feature. Uh, my understanding is that is a built-in systemd feature for uh, roaming profiles. I might be wrong on that because again, I haven't looked into it. So just judging, I mean, I did look into it for a few minutes and you know, I got the description and figured this wasn't something that I wanted to do because I, you know, I have sync things. So I have all my files syncing to everything, but um, a roaming profile solution could be like a, a big thing for enterprise. I think some home lab people will like this too, but if they have like multiple family members using their servers, that might be cool to have a roaming profile. Again, take everything I said about it with a grain of salt, because until I actually look into it, um, I don't know all there is to know about it. 
but it might be fun to still kind of just look at it anyway, just to kind of um, see how it works. I, I can't implement it into production because a roaming profile, a sync thing, that sounds like a recipe for disaster to have both at the same time. But um, I, I think that SystemD HomeD might be a good thing for a lot of people. And I remember when it came out, uh, people were very oppositional. It's like, what? SystemD wants to manage my home directory now? What's next? It, no, 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 no. <laughs> Calm down. It's not about your home directory. It's a feature you can implement if you want to uh, use this. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's probably not going to factor into a lot of people. But again, enterprise people and home lab with multiple users might think that's an attractive feature. So I do think I'll look into it at some point in a lab environment for sure. Yeah. All right. I think we've covered it all. Yeah. As, as I mean, far as we can in a podcast, all. I should say. <laughs> yeah. That's, we could do a whole series on this. Um, but but I think that'll whet everyone's appetite for the video. I think it'll all come together when you see everything on the screen recording and I go through everything. Um, there's going to be time codes and all of that. So you can you know go right into what I'm talking about here. Um, again, there's not going to be, as far as I know, unless I change this afterwards, there's not going to be a discussion in that video about timers or mounts. But that could be something that I cover later. Also, journal CTL, the journaling component of, component of System D. I figure that'll have to be its own video, and I've pretty much covered that in multiple videos. But I may do a dedicated one at some point. Yep. All yeah. right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will see you guys next time. This was definitely a fun episode, and I'm really looking forward to the System D video to learn some new tricks uh, more than hey. you know me and Jay from last night learned. But I at least have more stuff to click on. All right, mm -hmm. everyone take care and see you next time. See you next time.